Hey there everybody, physics time again. In this video, we're going to learn about what happens when there are unbalanced torques on an object. Uh, basically, we're going to rewrite Newton's second law of motion, remember that's the whole acceleration equals force over mass business, for a rotating object and torques. So first of all, let's remember that torque is the perpendicular force times the moment arm, or F cross R. And if we have an unbalanced torque, Last time we had balanced torques, today we have balanced torques. That means that the net torque is zero. Then that's going to cause the object to rotate and accelerate. And so that means it's going to have an angular acceleration. Remember that the symbol for angular acceleration is the Greek letter alpha, lowercase alpha. Kind of looks like a fish. So for example, suppose we have this object, which is pivoted in the middle. So that's our axis, that black dot in the middle. And we have a 25 newton force on the left edge at a radius of 0.4 meters, excuse me, moment arm, 0.4 meters. And then a 100 newton force on the other side with a moment arm of 0.2 meters. To find the net torque on that bad boy, we would simply add the torque due to each individual force. So the blue force would be 100 times 0.2, and then the red force would be 25 times 0.4. I'm going to make the blue one positive because that would cause the object to rotate counterclockwise. Remember, that's positive when we're considering torque. And so crunching those numbers would give you something like 10. Because the blue number is bigger, it would end up being positive. And so it would have a net torque that is counterclockwise of 10 newton times meters. And so that's going to cause this thing to have a counterclockwise acceleration. And so it'll start rotating and speeding up. So the next question is, how big is this acceleration? Remember from uh, way earlier in the year that Newton's second law gives us the acceleration due to a net force. We're going to have something very similar for a rotating object. So when we're rotating, we're going to replace the net force with the net torque. We're going to replace A with alpha for angular acceleration. So the only thing left over to figure out is what do we do with the mass? So the acceleration is going to depend on the mass, but it's also going to depend on how it's distributed within the object. So this is something that's a little bit different. For forces and linear motion, it just depended on what the mass of the object was. It didn't depend on the shape of the object. But for a rotating object, it does depend on the shape of the object. The way that we quantify that is with a term called moment of inertia, which we're going to give the symbol capital I. And so I'm going to put I on bottom of our second law equation. So alpha equals net torque over net torque over I. And then let's dig into this whole moment of inertia thing a little bit more in depth. So the moment of inertia depends on the mass of the object. And again, it also depends on how it's distributed within the object. Basically, you can say it depends on the shape of the object. The more mass that is concentrated farther away from the center, or the um, axis rather, of rotation, then the bigger the moment of inertia is going to be. And so a good example would be if you ever try to pick up like a long board. It's like a two by four try to pick it up, um, probably you're going to instinctively pick it up by holding it in the middle. The reason that you're going to pick it up in the middle is because it's more difficult to rotate it if your hand is farther away from the majority of the mass. To kind of draw a picture, it's hard to hold a board at the end and pick it up or rotate it, whereas it's a lot easier if you grab it in the middle. The difference is that the mass, it's where the mass is located. So the farther away the mass is from the axis of rotation, the bigger the moment of inertia, and therefore the more difficult it is to make it rotate. So a general form of the equation to find the moment of inertia is something is some fraction of the mass times the length of the object, or the radius if it's circular, squared. So that's just a general form of the equation. Um, and I'll show you some examples here in just a second. The unit for the moment of inertia would be kilograms, so mass would be kilograms, and then the L would be measured in meters, so it would be kilogram per time meter squared. 
So here are some examples of some simple shapes. And you can find a, you know, a table in any physics book or the interwebs, um, wherever you can Google things. Um, the first kind of shape we might encounter is a thin hoop. So like imagine a ring that you're looking at it from above. That red dot represents the axis through the center. In that situation, the moment of inertia is just the mass times the radius of the hoop squared. If we take the hoop and we basically fill it in, like we make it a solid cylinder instead, then we would have a one-half term in there. It would be I equals one-half mr squared. The reason why the moment of inertia would be smaller is because now instead of our mass all being located at the edge, the mass is like evenly distributed throughout. And so that's why the moment of inertia went down. Another shape we might encounter is a sphere. A sphere would be something like I equals two fifths mr squared. So for a sphere as opposed to a cylinder, again, we've got more mass concentrated closer to the axis than we do for the cylinder. The next shape we might see is a uniform rod, where we hold it at one end. The moment of inertia equation there will be one-third ml squared. Whereas if we hold it in the center, instead of at the end, the moment of inertia equation will be one-twelfth ml squared. Now you don't need to be able to determine how you come up with these. Those would be things that are given to us. Um, all you really need to be able to do is, is use those, and, and we'll see some examples of how we use those. So again, this replaces the mass in everything about rotation. So here's our example we were dealing with earlier. Uh, we found we had a net torque of 10 newton times meter counterclockwise. And let's suppose that this bar-shaped thing has a mass of half a kilogram and is 0.8 meters long. And so this would be a uniform rod or bar pivoted in the center. So the equation for finding the moment of inertia will be 1 12th ml squared. And so just plugging in those simple numbers, you would get something like that for the moment of inertia. Pretty small because 1 12th is a pretty small fraction. And so to find the angular acceleration, we would just take that net torque of 10 divided by the moment of inertia we just found, which would give you something like 375, somewhere in that neighborhood. To figure out the units, I'm going to kind of write it like this. Remember that a newton is a kilogram times meter. And so if we take the newton, or a kilogram meter per second squared, multiply it by another meter, and then divide it by a kilogram per, or a times meter squared, your kilograms cancel out your meters all cancel out, leaving you with just seconds squared on bottom of the fraction. So remember, if it's a rotating object, we replace the top with radians. So remember, that's a ratio. Meters over meters give you radians. And again, don't forget the direction. That would be counterclockwise. All right, so here's another simple example. Um, we got a wheel, and we're going to say that this wheel is a solid cylinder, so like a pizza uh, stone or something like that. It has a radius of 0.2 meters, mass of 6 kilograms. We apply a 4 newton force at the edge of the wheel, perpendicular to its radius. We want to know what is the acceleration of the wheel. So hit the pause button for a minute. See if you can just work through that, find the angular acceleration of the wheel. And then press play and I'll run through my solution and see if you did it the same way I did. So pause, take a minute to work that. Did you really press pause or are you just waiting for me to do it? Okay, so here's my picture. There's my wheel. And I've got a 4 newton force perpendicular to the radius. So it didn't really tell you which direction it is or how it's oriented. We just know that it's perpendicular to the radius. I know I'm going to use Newton's second law, so alpha equals net torque over I. I know the torque is the perpendicular force times the moment arm. And then I know that the cylinder's moment of inertia equation is one half mr squared. 
I know that because we wrote it down just a minute ago. So the force is perpendicular, perpendicular to the radius, so I can just find the torque by doing 4 times 0 0.2. And then 1 half 6 times 0 0.2 squared will give me my moment of inertia. And so that would be something like that, 6.7 radians per second squared. Now the thing that I need you to be careful about, we're going to see examples of this when we get to class, is that this R and this R are not always going to be the same. The little r is dependent on where you apply the force. So for example, if I had a different force that was applied like right here, then r would be something besides 0.2. So the way that I've drawn it looks like it's about halfway between the edge and the center. So if that were the situation, then instead of using 0.2 for my little r, I would have used 0.1. But that doesn't have anything to do with the r for the moment of inertia. That r is the actual physical radius of the wheel. It depends on the wheel, not on any of the forces that are applied to it. So be careful. There's a, there's a reason that we wrote the little r on top the little r, and the big r on bottom as a big r. They're not always the same um, r. So that little r is the moment r that depends on where the force is applied. The big r is the radius of the object that depends on the properties of the object. So we'll see examples of that in class, see if we can nail this down a little bit uh, better. Until then, ta-ta.